my name is Stephen May and welcome to That Show with Mahi. Today I'm talking to Deb Feiland. Now Deb is, well, let's, I mean, I'm, I sometimes got to try and predict what people actually do and I get it wrong. So Deb, <laughs> just a brief description. What, what, what do you do? Uh, you're not a vocal coach, you're a vocal technician, vocal specialist. I'm, um, I'm a speech pathologist, first and foremost. Okay. Um, so, so you're right, check that. But yeah, and, and a voice consultant. So yeah. the two go hand in hand. But I think probably the first thing that started really is probably even more important is I'm also a singer. So uh, they all come in together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've, I mean, I've, I've seen you in various different shows. You sort of, you've come in and out over the last sort of 15 years that I've been around. Um, how long have you been in the industry as attached to musicals in the sense that you're a guiding hand? Um, probably my first foray into wearing this hat, you know, the, the voice consultant, speech pathologist role is probably, it's a really good question, probably about 20 years ago. Probably yeah. started with a few different shows along the way, like I recall, certainly um, when it was more formalised was with Lion King the first time. Okay. Uh, and also, um, oh, there've been other shows as well. Um, Journey Girl, which Amanda Harrison was in, yeah. Um, yeah, along the way. I think there are a number of shows that I sort of remember being quite pivotal. They're about twenty years ago, but particularly, I think Melbourne Theatre Company was about twenty-two years ago when I started having a role in just helping in preventing vocal injuries and trying to help people do what they do well and um, be vocally successful. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we talk about vocal injuries um a lot of people get a bit worried they're like something's wrong with my voice they instantly go i've got this the word nodules or i've got something on my vocal yeah. cords and it's i don't know how many times someone's gone oh no i've got nodules or oh, it's a joke but really there's there's so many different areas mm -hmm. of what vocal uh, damage yeah. can be it's not necessarily if you have something wrong with your voice that you have a nodule there's a wide variety. What's, I mean, there's probably a lot of things you could talk about, but what's maybe like the top three that aren't nodules that people could probably check first? Absolutely. Could I, could I start before just quickly saying about nodules that bizarrely, even though people most worry about nodules, it's the thing we least see. <laughs> and um, I always find absolutely fascinating that the, if I you know, got a dollar for every time someone came in for a scope and was really worried that they had nodules, I'd be really rich. And you know, I really can't tell you um, firstly, that they are um, virtually, or not just rare, but almost impossible to have as men because just physiologically it doesn't make sense that men would have nodules. So we, we rarely, if ever, see true nodules in men. Right. So, so, and that's a real myth that I just love busting, you know, yeah. because um, it's just physiologically not possible because nodules are formed by the particular place in the vocal folds where they contact the striking zone. Mm. is where nodules can be formed and that's not the same spot for men as it is for women with fully grown men with normal vocal cords so anyway that's just a little one but the yeah. question the most common would be swelling edema okay. so um we would see that many many times and certainly you've all experienced that at some stage whether you've been yelling or using your voice a lot but certainly in the context of performers um as you well know Stephen heavy vocal loads, can, yeah. you know, eight shows a week and other things going on are likely to promote swelling. It's not a big deal. It's not pathology. It's just um, it may sort of become compounded and then become problematic because there's not enough time to recover and resolve it. Um, so swelling. Um, in terms of injuries, I think probably the most common we see would be a hemorrhage um, yeah. in, or some sort, of a, some sort of a vascular event as an acute injury. So that... Um, and, you know, it's, it's really, really scary and daunting, but it's completely resolvable you know, in terms of if it's well managed. So um, that would be just one of the most... On that, Sorry? when you say the word hemorrhage, I, I kind of go, <laughs> okay, what, what, is, what is a hemorrhage? Yeah, I thought you looked a bit aghast. <laughs> um, it's like, it's everyone's worst nightmare. And it is, it's, it's horrific. And, you know, you've got lots of colleagues, I know that you would know Stephen, we all know, who have been midway through a show and something's just gone ping, you know. Mm. And basically what's happened is you just have a little burst blood vessel. And we're talking about a tiny, tiny little thing, yeah. a little tiny blood vessel that bursts. And so um, suddenly the vocal fold, you know, within the vocal fold substrate, there's a, um, a bleed. Um, and that can be something that can be a really micro bleed and can be really quickly turned around, or it can be the whole cord um, 
usually it's associated with complete loss of voice or a, just being unable to do anything with your voice. So yeah. I'm sure that there've been times that or certainly I have where I've been in the audience and I've known something like that has happened. And it's just absolutely horrific for the performer at that particular time. And getting someone back on after that experience, say, you know, 10, 14 days later, um, the typical time before we'd see them being able to sort of be confident to get back um, mm. is often really scary because they look so fearful because it's, you know, it's just literally dying on stage. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it's not to do with anything to do with technique or it's just bad luck. You know, um, it, yeah. it is, sometimes it can be sort of due to a whole lot of reasons, like in the case of female, she may be premenstrual, you know, a day or so before a period, um, or it might be that um, someone has been given a thinning agent, like a cough mixture or something, because they've had a bit of a cough and has happened with one person just before going on. Someone was, you know, as always, performers will want to help one another and someone gave their brew to them, so they had to run on and... Um, and of course, that's a thinner, and you know, whether that is related or not, who knows? But aspirin, disparin, any of those thinners can can increase the risk of a hemorrhage. Yeah. And, you know, so that would be. I mean, it's not common, but it's certainly one of the. the when you talk about vocal injuries amongst performers, that would be one. Okay. The other one could be like a little micro tear, like a little um, just a within the mucosa itself. So someone gets a bit swollen, and then it becomes um, develops into something like what's called a pseudocyst or a polyp or um, in other circumstances, people can develop cysts, et cetera. So they're sort of probably the most common we see. But I need to say, because I feel like you know, we've gone straight into the injury side, that really um, even a muscular fatigue can be, feel like an injury. Um, yeah. And they're all things that are completely resolvable. Um, it's very, very, very rare that, if ever, that I've seen something I don't think is resolvable other than someone to continuing to sing through an injury and not taking the appropriate management yeah and i think that's an interesting um topic to sort of get into is the singing through when um you know you're in a show you've got that responsibility to do eight shows a week you don't want to let your cast down you don't want to let you know the producers down so mentally you're like no i'm just going to push through because if i've got a little niggle whether it's a cold or whether it's sort of like oh it's kind of it's only sore a little bit but i'm okay if I do my steaming and do my blow my bubbles and, you know, X, Y, Z. And then you're like, well, that wasn't a bad show. So I'll, I'll just wake up the next day and it's, oh, it's kind of there, but you kind of push through. There's an old school mentality, definitely, that the show must go on. So you do take your aspirin or whatever. Um, how? But not aspirin, not aspirin, hopefully. <laughs> not, well, no, but I mean, there's, you know, there's, everyone's got their different tricks of what they would use. I mean, yeah. I, I am, I'm, yeah, some people say like have a, um, a glass of Coca-Cola and they're like, oh, that, you know, clears everything out of the way and off you go. At what point can or should a vocalist stop and say, okay, I'm just going to, I need to tag out here? Great question. And I was going to throw it right back at you, Stephen, um, to some extent, because I think it's so individually determined. And I'm going to be cheeky and say someone like you who is, um, fairly stoic and would be very disinclined to, 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 to not go on unless you really couldn't is are people that worry me the most, you know, because, because the idea that, um, that edict of, um, I don't think worry me the most because you don't, you, you've got, you know, you, you're going to be fine, I'm sure, most of the time, but it's really difficult, particularly with males, and I'm going to be very gender specific in my experience, um, it's, this, if you're so used to being able to even be a bit under par, but still get out there and deliver a great show. Um, and so there are different vulnerabilities for females and males with their voice in terms of the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and so the decision as to whether to perform or not is a really tough one. At what stage, what threshold do you have to make that decision as to whether or not you are you going to do the show you need to do? Well, obviously, you're always going to want to do your A show, but there will be, let's be honest, the big times you know you did your B show. Yeah, yeah. That, you need yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, um, and there'll be times you might even do your C show and none of us in the audience really want to regularly see a C show. Um, but, um, you know, we know that there are going to be times that people will, will have to do that. Um, and so, so that to answer your question, when you shouldn't go on um, is very much an individual decision. 
and mm. it should be based on a couple of things. From one should be that you feel you can deliver the show you know is acceptable creatively and artistically for what you want to do. That's yep. your choice, never mine. Always yours. You know, do you feel you can do what you need to do as an artist and do do a great show? Which um, is obviously the first decision. The second decision which I think is probably something that needs external help, is do I have symptoms that suggest that I am not likely to last the distance? And that's where I think someone like me or an equivalent um, having a scientific background can sort of predict based on what your symptoms are and your signs and things you're describing about your voice, how it feels particularly, yeah. not just how it sounds, um, will be a, an indication. Is my my uh, problem solving or triage decision is, is this person having at the beginning of a respiratory tract infection? By performing, are they likely to accelerate the impact of that upper respiratory tract infection or ERTI on the vocal folds and therefore increase their risk of either an injury or of fatigue during the show? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, or is there something else going, have they got fatigue that is quite stimulable or responsive to some exercises? So I'll do some quick little tricks and you know, you've mentioned before, you'll all do your own tricks, but I think there are specific ones I would do always to see how much can I shift this sound for this person right now to yeah. make sure that they're going to actually get better as the show goes on, yes. not get worse. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so things like certainly being able to go up and down, you know, have a really good glide, you know, with a continuous sound is really crucial without changing quality. Um, so being able to navigate the passaggio or the bridge without it, the obvious sort of breaks there. Yep. But particularly, how does it feel? Does it feel uncomfortable? Does it feel scratchy? Pain is an absolute, uh, any pain, off you go. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, if there's pain already. Um, but pain's a funny one because what people call discomfort might be pain and vice versa. But if there's actually frank radiating pain, um, I'm interested in that. My, my decision-making or dichotomy is always, is this muscular or is this mucosal? Stop me if I'm rabbiting on here. No, 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 it's just great. <laughs> Um, is it muscular or is it mucosal? Is it, is it something to do? Is, it, is they just fatigue there? Can I unload that? And I want to talk about unloading if we can. Yes. Um, but can I unload that for, or help them unload that by doing intrinsic exercises that will bring back the cords into gear rather than anything external, which may take away the support they have for what's going on internally? You know, yes. so, so can we get that muscular component sorted? Or am I hearing some things in the cords, you know, that are telling me, oh, you know, that person's vulnerable. Um, and I'm, I'm going to diverge quickly to say I've made some really terrible mistakes about that, you know, along the way, which is, you know, I suppose when I'm old now, I can look back and realise that, um, which have helped me be much clearer in my mind as to what things constitute risk, a high enough risk to not recommend going on. You know, ultimately, it's right. always the, um, the performance decision. And all I'm doing is giving a, you know, some some recommendations, etc. But I have you know said to people, I think you're okay, you know. And um, this is a, hopefully, or thankfully, a long time ago. Thank goodness, um, I think I've got wiser. But I think I felt really prey to that too, Stephen. That the show must go on, and they were desperate to go on, and they had people in the audience, or they yeah. were didn't want to let the show down. They, you know, people like yourself. I'm going to go out there, and, and I said, yeah, yeah. I backed them. Now. If I say, um, you know, I'm really worried about you, generally I feel confident in also relaying that to also to the producers or to the um, you know, company management or whoever it might be, say, I don't feel that that is going to be realistic for that person. Yeah. However, I can also smell a rat. <laughs> so, so I've had, I've got better at that too. I've also been played, you know, by some performers in the past, again, a fair while ago, where people would think that really they didn't want to go on for other reasons. And the company might say, I'll give Deb a ring or, and sometimes they'd say they'd run me and they hadn't. Wow. Um, said that I had said, it's quite extraordinary, said Deb said not to go on. Or they rang and they were like, oh, you know, I'm feeling it's, a, it's just a bit croaky today and I've got this, this, and I can play around. I, go, I think you're okay vocally. You need to make a decision, you know, and not back them. So it, it's a really, it's a, I mean, of course, everyone's really professional. They're a, really, they're a very small minority. But, you know, yep. let's be honest. Well, you all have days where you think, I oh, just, I don't know if I've got it in me, you know. And that's okay because it's because that is a worry to me. If you don't feel you've got it in you mentally, then your voice is not going to be great either, you know. Um, but does that make me concerned that that show is not, you know, 
accessible, sorry, that voice is not going to be great, but I know it just makes me more worry about where we're heading. And so start looking at the psychological contributions, you know. Yeah. So. Um, I think psychology is, plays a big part in a lot of things. Um, I yeah. wanted to sort of talk about singers that have got the money note in a show and yeah. it becomes, the show becomes about the money note. Now, I, I, I mean, I know, I know specifically, in, in, even with myself, there's just been there's songs that you choose and you go, all right, I know that's the B flat and I've got to hit that one and it's got to be clear every night. And the moment that it's not clear, my brain goes, I can't hit that note or there's something wrong with me. In, yeah. As a speech, speech pathologist and, you know, looking after someone vocally, how much is that then a part of your job or is that like I have to pass you on to somebody else now that's going to get you sort of off the cliff, um, but also figuring out ways to do that. And I mean, I think if you can answer this question, oh, <laughs> you're going to be um, the, the industry's God uh, because it is a psychology thing that I think a lot of people just don't know how to get over. Um, yeah. Do you have any information on that? But, but information, yeah, or perhaps just experience with it, the same, yeah. I agree with you. It's a really tough one. I think there's a couple of things. The first time, if someone is becoming really obsessed, and people do, about those notes or particular parts about the sound, it's about unpacking that yeah. and, um, and making sure. And I think that I do feel I can help, or not I, but I think we, in terms of what, what skills speech pathologists in this context bring to the equation, and there are other people like me that do the same, that we, we're trying to help you do that efficiently. And um, that, and so we were working on this idea of the efficiency and a science of it, to, to, just to take away that whole idea of the artistic sort of um, extra layers that are on it. Yes. So say, so, okay, what sound do you want? Okay, the way to do that is by, so it may be about working on really getting, improving some of the respiratory drive, so their support or, you know, whatever. It may be about just, really trying to change some of the laryngeal postures. So within the throat, how someone's navigating the onset or the, or the actual maintenance of that sound. Mm -hmm. Invariably, it might be about tongue position or you know, whatever. So we might play around with that, but get them to be able to find that spot reliably at a physical efficiency level so they can bring the extra color in later, you know. Yes. Um, and so, so, that's, so, so that's my answer to your question. That's the first component. The second component is, and then if there is fear, try to work out, is that because, and it often is, because that spot is not reliable? Is it because there is a, a physical weakness or an issue there that as soon as they get swollen, that's the one spot that's going to show and reflect that they're fatigued? Yeah. And that's usually, to me, when people get obsessed with that, or not obsessed, but overly worried about it, it's yeah. usually for a really good reason. Um, and the psychology becomes a chicken and an egg that mm -hmm. they become worried about it because it's not reliable, you know, and, um, and because they're worried about it, it's not reliable. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. um, but both two, the two things come into play. The hardest thing often for me is also convincing um, even directors and producers that that person is not psychologically frail or fragile or um, unstable or anything. Yeah. Um, quite the opposite. They are wanting to deliver that and they know how it has to be and it doesn't feel exactly right. So again, it's about trying to sort of almost be an advocate for, for the singer a bit there too. We're saying, okay, how do we make sure that, does that mean they might need to just do six shows a week rather than eight yeah. so they can get that money note reliably? Because yeah. particularly females, we do have vocal fatigue more than males because of a whole lot of reasons. One being that our vocal folds vibrate quicker because we sing higher. Um, so therefore they smash, smash against each other more often. But secondly, you know, the female larynx is, um, is um, influenced by hormones and all sorts of other things. And so, um, and, and a whole lot of other reasons. So I think, you know, take for example, the classic role of a role like of an alpha bar or whatever. There's a reason why that's not an eight show a week, you know, so for, for a lot of alpha bars because for some people it sits, they get it, they get employed because they're really exciting right at that spot of the, ah, you know. Yeah, so yeah. so it's going to be, a, but to do that eight shows a week is, you know, and I've met many of an alpha bar, um, both within Australia and overseas, mm -hmm. um, who have all said the same, that, it, you know, there are certain roles like that and there are many others. And you know there are roles certainly, um, um, Jersey Voice, you know, certain the Frankie Valleys, there's mm -hmm. certain roles that are just really hard to do. So... A very long-winded answer, but the money note is so it's really important that we focus on that. Um, I know he wouldn't mind me talking about, you know, for someone like you know, Callum Francis, 
playing um, in kinky boots um, with um, the role of Lola, um, you know, really wanted always to deliver his A, a game, you know, and, and he did. And, um, you know, and I think that um, there are times so that singing that high for a male voice is just extraordinary. And so recognising roles like that and, and navigating, and we're really lucky in Australia. We have amazing um, producers, I think, comparative to what I know um, on um, West End and um, Broadway, where they are prepared to look at, okay, what's going to work best for this performer? So, yeah, so... Um, the psychology, yes, some people will need to go and see, um, you know, get some extra help about that because it becomes so fearful. But I feel like, I feel that's probably one thing I do pretty well is helping people really get better at accessing that one spot uh, from a physical point of view, and then if it be, and helping them see that if they can do that and they can't do it, deliver it on stage, then they may need to get some extra help psychologically. But yeah. that's pretty rare. Because I guess the fear is that you could probably do it in a rehearsal um, space. You could get on the stage with them and you can have all the elements, um, but it's not until you get out onto that stage. And it could be three quarters of the way into the show until you're sort of doing the 11 o'clock number that your show just becomes about that instead of coming from your truth. And so you, you know, you're not talking, you, all you're doing is thinking about it in your head and you're not coming from here. Um, yeah. I mean, at any any point of stage or something just different on a, on the seventh show, you're like, whoa, my shoulder just did something really different there. You know, yeah. automatically you've gone. It's all about my shoulder for the next, you know, 45 minutes. Yeah. yeah. And look, I think that's something that's been really great for me to learn is just, I I think it's very easy as a speech path. You know, I'm, I mean, it's I think it's good that I'm a performer, that I've had that background, yeah. um, you know, not at your all your levels. Um, obviously, which is, um, you know, it's, but it's important that I understand you've got so many things going on. And mm. for me to introduce what, and I, another mistake I've made, you know, just talk about my, my, um, my weaknesses here, but, um, but another mistake I made very early on, maybe, you know, 20 years ago with the show was really um, unpacked the way someone was singing, um, you know, in terms of, and he went on stage and, um, I had a phone call from the director saying, what did you do with my blur blur person you know, yeah, role? Yeah, um, yeah. We could, and he became so focused on singing well that he lost the character. And, you know, and that was my inexperience too by trying to help him be more efficient. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I, I, mean, I, I, don't, I hope I would never do that. And the first thing I do now is, you know, we work on stuff, but it's not, you know, when you're on stage, just do what you're always doing. Let's set it up so your muscle memory is when you get out there, you're just going to do it better or whatever. You know? Yeah. So. I guess then, I mean, it probably raises the question to say then what part of the process should you be coming in at? I mean, everyone would love to be able to have everyone at their, you know, beck and call from day one. Um, that's not necessarily cost effective for all producers, but there's certainly um, positions that people get into on stage. You know, they're bending down, they're facing up, they've got someone on their shoulder. Um, I guess there's not a lot of dead violin that we can spread you across the whole country. Um, but maybe it, it is a question that we need to ask that, you know, in the room, we need somebody there to sort of just say, Hey, look, this is what I'm doing. Um, can you just keep an eye on me for that? Um, yeah, I'm probably I not going to be able to convince many producers to do that, but I think it's no, important that you come in in the beginning, not, not at um, tech time or at uh, just before opening night, because, you know, if I spoke to you four weeks ago, we could have had that discussion and we could have just rehearsed it, then produced it. Well, I think, but I think that's what we've been doing, isn't it, really? I mean, I think we're really lucky that Australia does have a great prehab model, you know? Yeah. I mean, there are people like, you know, like Louise Withers, as you well know, with you know, yeah. Mamma Mia, you know, Stephen, you know, that's, she's really about this set it up well from the beginning. And yeah. so that, you know, I mean, you know, people like me are in the rehearsal space from day one. Um, we're hearing, you know, I mean, we're not obviously not, not, I don't mean we're sitting there with every rehearsal, but at that first meet and greet, getting a sense of where the voice is doing a screen, you know, then watching runs to see what's happening. Yeah. The same with you know, Disney, you know, um, I've been involved in, um, you know, all the big Disney shows, you know, for many years now for the same reason. And, and uh, lots of others, I don't want to, I shouldn't be singling out to individuals, but those two stand in mind because they've been very proactive mm. about having a, um, a very strong commitment to to um, predicting and minimising risk. So not just with me, but with physios. You know, not just sorry, not just with speech path, but with physios as well. But this idea: yeah. how do we do this? And this model works. And 
Um, this is, you know, it's a model that's now being adopted, um, certainly on Broadway, and this is not a, you know, wow dip situation. It's just we've had these really progressive, forward-thinking um, people within Australia, particularly Melbourne Theatre Company, I should have mentioned. There's probably, you know, I remember from an early stage, key people, you know, um, getting people like me involved um, and Simon Phillips being really encouraging of this as well as a director. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's a hard slog because a number of performers are, are very anxious about that. Does that mean they think I've got a problem? Or if I say there's an issue, does that mean that they'll put down, oh, she's going she, she's gonna to have a problem in the future or whatever? Um, and it's also you guys trusting that the producers are doing it because they're protecting their show, but they're also protecting you yeah. as part of their work cover responsibility. And I get told enormous amount of stuff when that first meet and greet, when I do the chat with the, I'm oh, sorry, this first vocal screen on bass lines with performance, I get told about, oh, this happened to in a prior show and I didn't tell anyone, I didn't want to prefer his work cover because, you know, obviously it's a dirty word, yada, yada, mm -hmm. and don't tell the producers. And so I, you know, and I'm employed to be there to help. So that information stays within my knowledge and so that I can then say, well, okay, let's make sure that doesn't happen for you again by doing this, 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 you know. So yeah. Yeah. I think we've come a long way and there's some great literature now out there and Broadway um, produces some and, um, and um, you know, um, certainly in London perhaps not quite as successfully yet with this model, but we're moving towards that, realising that this saves money absolutely saves the producers money as well yeah. um, um yeah. you'd mentioned before you wanted to um, touch on unloading which uh, yeah. i think you know is is a great thing because in this time people are either really going out there and they're smashing out a song you know every other day having a good time or some people are sitting at home and going like i'm i found myself just really exhausted um so i guess the rest period that people should be taking right now is, is a good time but as you sort of said, it's not using that voice regularly enough. Uh, and so you, they could find a little bit of tension from fear, from anxiety of COVID-19, of uncertainty of job um, coming out. What's sort of maybe sort of a great way to wrap up as well that, okay, baby steps, um, and because you might find that there is some loading there, and then how do we unload? Right. Okay, so firstly, um, what I mean by loading is if somebody has actually become really um, quite tense and, um, and quite um, muscular because they've been overloading. Um, yep. But the idea of load is, of course, and I'll try and you know, praise this, but um, how much you use your voice will be determined by your own vocal fitness mm -hmm. and your own stamina and your own genetics and your own psyche and yada, yada. So how much you can go, how much dose you can achieve for your voice before getting fatigued will be individually determined. But the better you sing, the longer you can sing. So that yeah. makes sense. So, yeah. um, but um, and gender will be very specific here too in terms of how much someone can sing for. So when someone gets overloaded, the symptoms that often, well, you know, that fatigue we all feel, you know, the voice feels like you're just about half a voice. You yeah. feel like you're sitting either high, if you've been singing up high, you can't bring it down low, yeah. or you'll feel um, just that swollen feeling, tender, yada, yada. Yeah. It's great to have, and I'm a big believer in getting, um, you know, some support from, um, you know, variety of different therapists, um, you know, physios, um, osteopaths, um, my therapists and the likes, great. But be careful when you do that, that you're not actually, in fact, just taking away all that support. Yeah. So the best way to unload is always to do it intrinsically as a first step. And that is to, whether that be strawing, making a kazoo sound, so that sound, and mm -hmm. doing that for a while, just to unpack what's going on within the cords and massage out the swelling. Lip trills, tongue trills, all of those things that you all do, you know, are great for unloading. Um, even putting a, you know, a, the, the dead neb, the nebulizer mask, you know, and, ooh, and just sort of give a bit of back pressure to sort yep. of get things on. But your question related to underloading, I think, is really important. We're gonna, you can lose fitness really quickly. So those of you who aren't performing, because there aren't any shows, sadly, on, um, obviously, it means most of us, we need to be really making sure we maintain fitness. So um, even though you don't feel like it, making sure you have a good workout vocally to keep mm -hmm. fitness. Um, it's going to be great for your soul, your well-being, for your immunoglobin levels. Get back to singing stuff that you haven't sung for ages. Get out there and give it a workout. Um, and tap into singing for, for joy because we know it improves your immune response. We know that uh, it'll improve your vocal fitness. So when we're all chomping the bit and ready to go again, which hopefully you know really happens sooner rather than later, obviously, Mm. then you'll be ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, I've, I've held a lot of your time up. Is there anything else that you sort of wanted, wanted to add um, 
that you've kind of been concerned or you, there's a few alarm bells that have really you wanted to address with a bunch of people or um, that we can really start to think about? Um, that's a terrible question. Yeah, I, just, no, I guess, no. I guess, yeah, is there, some, is there a couple of things that you kind of go, you know, look, I, I want to take this on to the next show and I've learned that and I really want to get the, the industry to start thinking this way. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. Um, I presume your um, you know, people who may be watching this are, are, are your colleagues and friends and, and mine as well, Steve. And so I feel like we're preaching converted, but I want you all to look after one another a bit better about vocal health. What I mean by that is that to feel, so people feel supported if they call out, if they can't do a show, if they feel that it is getting stressful in that notes, to understand that that it doesn't mean that they've um, that they're not a great performer it could mean they're a fantastic performer it just but to support one another and not judge it um i feel like you know it's a really that's probably the one thing we're still to move a little bit further on so that people don't feel like they have to get on because there's an expectation that supporters of one another would be and 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 secondly on that note not presuming that what works for you will work for them <laughs> yeah. you know so yeah. don't hand your cortisone to the, the Mr. Logan. Make sure they contact someone like me and just get a real sense of because we're comparing apples and oranges. <laughs> Their voice problem may be very different. So don't hand on your bread. Don't hand on your cough medicine. You know, don't kill them with kindness. You know, yeah. you you do know a lot, but you know a lot for you, not necessarily for that person. Yeah. Yeah. I, probably that's the main one. But look, I just I, I, I love you all, I love this industry. I just I suppose I just want to finish from my end. I'm just saying that I really want you to go back to enjoying singing as a joy, as I mentioned before, and to really remember why you're so fantastic at what you do and celebrate your own voices. Um, even for yourself, rather we can't have the joy of experiencing them at the moment, but make sure you tap back into your voices. And, uh, and just enjoy the sound because I can guarantee the better the sound, the healthier you're going to be. So, yeah. yeah. That's great. Thanks, Deb. And I, I really appreciate the honesty that you've sort of brought to this um, conversation in the sense it's like, you know, back in the day you made some mistakes and what you've learned from and you're still here. Um, and I know a lot of people, um, it's still their trust in you and, that, and that's a big responsibility. So if I can speak on behalf of everyone, um, we'd like to say thank you because, uh, you know, you have been there, like you've been there since the beginning of my career and I'm sure other people's careers. So um, thank you for all your support and um, yeah, uh, persistence, you know, calm <laughs> just, and, and your patience, um, you know, to, to look after us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Stephen. And good luck with all your journeys. This is a great idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> See ya.